We need to talk about the gays. Sorry. The gays. We'll start here and then we'll go in further. As a famous ogre once said, We both have layers. So, give me some time and I promise I will get to him. So, the gays. You're looking at me, I'm looking at you. That's the gays, right? Well, sort of. Jean-Paul Sartre does a much better job at explaining it in his 1943 book, Being and Nothingness. Super enticing title, I know. Really great beach read. But in this, the gaze is the concept of awareness, either of you, me, or other people. Sartre describes an object as either being pour soi, being conscious of themselves, or in soi, being unconscious of themselves. This computer would be in soi. You and I would be pour soi. We are aware of ourselves, of our own consciousness, and must therefore create our own being. We do not have a defined essence. Instead, we have the titular nothingness. This discovery of consciousness is only enabled by another individual looking upon us. When we are watched, we become aware of our own presence, and we feel how the gaze of the other person objectifies us, forcing us to view ourselves as objects. This illuminates the ideas of subjectivity and objectivity, and we then feel the need to control how we are perceived through outward actions and performances. It's some really positive, uplifting stuff. I know, really great start. So, I'm an object. Hooray! Great, where do we go from here? Well, if you live in a patriarchal society, you can turn and find someone else that you can objectify to give yourself the subjectivity and power within a relationship. Duh. This results in what is known as the male gaze. You know, the thing responsible for giving us really spectacular scenes such as this. That your distributor cap's a little loose. And this. And this. And this, and this, and this, and you're probably uncomfortable, right? Good. Oh. That's my butler. Sorry, that was really, really abysmal and I couldn't think of another way to transition into Judith Butler. But we can't discuss the gendered gaze without discussing the performance of gender in her book, Gender Trouble, Feminism, and the Subversion of Identity. In the chapter Subversive Bodily Acts, she writes, such acts, gestures, enactments, generally construed, are performative in the sense that the essence or identity that they otherwise purport to express are fabrications manufactured and sustained through corporeal signs and other discursive means. That the gendered body is performative suggests that it has no ontological status apart from the various acts which constitute its reality. This also suggests that if that reality is fabricated as an interior essence, that very inferiority is an effect and function of a decidedly public and social discourse, the public regulation of fantasy through the surface politics of the body, the gender border control that differentiates inner from outer, and so institutes the integrity of the subject. In other words, acts and gestures, articulated and enacted desires, create the illusion of an interior and organizing gender core, an illusion discursively maintained for the purposes of the regulation of sexuality within the obligatory frame of reproductive heterosexuality. Within this quote, Butler discusses the concept of the gendered body, how the body is merely a canvas for the performance and projection of gender. The actions and gestures we perform as part of our gender expression give the body its identity. Those actions and gestures are upheld by social constructs within the cultural hegemony that reinforce the gender norms bound under reproductive heterosexuality. They are performed to appease the perceptions and opinions of others, to project the common image of man or woman. Our Western enactment of an interior versus exterior of the body creates a rigid boundary that we maintain for social control. In relation to the gaze, the enactment of gender is a result of the subject-object relationship, of recognizing how the body is an object and imprinting certain signs onto it to express a certain objective identification. Our societal constructions of gender are substantiated by the actions we perform. We gender the body. We give it its identity. 
we bind the concept of gender and codify everything we do into a strict binary. Gender is a performance and the gaze affects the way we perform, specifically the male gaze. The male gaze was fundamentally born as a media theory, a concept existing within movies, TV, ads, etc. Just any piece of content that can purposefully position something as an object. Laura Mulvey was the first to fully transcribe what the male gaze was in her essay Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. In a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active slash male and passive slash female. The determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female figure which is styled accordingly. The beauty of the woman as object and the screen space coalesce. She is no longer the bearer of guilt, but a perfect product, whose body, stylized and fragmented by close-ups, is the content of the film and the direct recipient of the spectator's look. Essentially, the male gaze frames the female body as an object, dragging the camera over oiled skin, tight clothes, anything to enhance her body as a thing for male pleasure. Mulvey also claims the male gaze operates on voyeurism and scopophilia, pleasure in looking at another person as an erotic object. Going far beyond highlighting a woman's to-be-looked-at-ness, cinema builds the way she is to be looked at into the spectacle itself. The general idea of this still permeates through film theory to this day. It defined and outlined a way of filmmaking that once noticed could not be unnoticed. However, Mulvey also later wrote that her theory should be looked at as an aspect of a historical movement, stepping stones to something greater rather than a piece intended to last. In relation to Butler, the male gaze reinforces the gendered actions and signifiers of a female body. The sexualization and fetishization of a body through a man's gaze only serves to further the harsh divide between male and female. Look at this woman's body. Look at how sexy she is. Look at her thighs, her chest, her lips. Look at how she moves. Everything appeals back to the frame of reproductive heterosexuality. The physical signifiers presented by the positioning of her body are a performance of an ultra-feminine, ideal woman. When this male gaze is so heavily perpetuated by the media we consume and the information we view, we begin to feel a constant sense of male voyeurism. As Butler says, this identity is fabrications manufactured and sustained through corporeal signs and other discursive means. Media positions the female body in an idealized way, and we begin to feel we must behave according to fit the expectation. The products we buy, the clothes we wear, the way we speak and walk and act, everything feels catered to the male gaze. Margaret Atwood says, Male fantasies, male fantasies, is everything run by male fantasies? Up on a pedestal or down on your knees, it's all a male fantasy, that you're strong enough to take what they dish out or else too weak to do anything about it. Even pretending you aren't catering to male fantasies is a male fantasy. Pretending you're unseen, pretending you have a life of your own, that you can wash your feet and comb your hair, unconscious of the ever-present watcher peering through the keyhole, peering through the keyhole in your own head if nowhere else. You are a woman with a man inside watching a woman. You are your own voyeur. So essentially, the male gaze conceptualized in real life is 1984's Big Brother if it was written by a misogynist. So, I guess it's just Big Brother then. But as film theory has progressed, so has the analysis of a male-dominated industry. Feminist and post-colonial film critique has risen more and more, and we've begun to conceptualize ways to subvert this gaze. As gender lends itself to the common binary, if we have a male gaze, we have to have a female gaze. Right? Right. The female gaze, as outlined by director Joey Solway, relies on three principles, feeling seeing, the gazed gaze, and returning the gaze. Feeling seeing utilizes the frame to share a feeling of being in feeling rather than looking at the characters, that my emotions are being prioritized over the actions. The female gaze focuses on reclaiming the body and using it to create a feeling seeing. The gazed gaze is about utilizing the camera as the receiver of the gaze. The camera says this is how it feels to be seen. Returning the gaze is about saying, I see you seeing me. It's about recognizing being seen as an object and reclaiming the subjectivity of the situation to reject the performance that the male gaze encourages and remove ourselves from societal standards. And what I want, it, what I want people to see is the female gaze is a conscious effort to create empathy as a political tool. It is a resting away, maybe even a wrestling away, of the point of view of changing the way the world feels for women when they move their bodies through the world. We're back to the body feeling themselves as the, as the subject. 
I really highly encourage you to go watch that keynote because even though there is so much more nuance beneath the concept of the female gaze, especially within a predominantly heterosexual world, Soloway really eloquently describes what it means at the base level to utilize the female gaze and how that stays anchored on an emotional foundation. The female gaze says, I was there and this is my shame and this is my life and this is my humor. I will take all of it and I will put it into my protagonist and I will light it and I will add music and we will side with her. Soloway also makes the important distinction, however, that the female gaze is not simply the opposite of the male gaze. It's not objectifying male bodies on screen for women's pleasure. Instead, the female gaze calls attention to the way that the male gaze divides us, splitting us into a binary, forcing us into categorical gender performance. They state that the female gaze can be utilized and created by anyone, that it is solely grounded by emotion. The female gaze is focused on fully realizing the woman, to integrate the body and the mind that has so long been objectified and flattened. The body within film is only substantiated and transformed into a real being by the mental and emotional workings of the individual. The content is always related to my own body and my feelings, reflecting pleasure as well as pain, the ambiguity and complexity of emotions, human gestures, multi-layered metaphysical symbols below the gut level translated into an art close to laughter. The female gaze focuses on decentering the body as sexual object and turning it into a tool for emotional communication. It's less about simply observing a gender performance and more about understanding the feeling of having been under that gender performance for so long. We are, as they said, creating from inside of our own bodies. Some wonderful examples of the female gaze within film include Fleabag, Roma, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, the Farewell, Pride and Prejudice, After Sun. Um, I mean, there are just so many wonderful examples. I could go on. Um, but as we usher more women into all aspects of the filmmaking industry, we've seen the rise of more and more stories that align with the female gaze. Women's stories matter. Yeah. yeah. Right. They just matter. They yeah. Do. Yeah. And, I, you know. and because women's stories matter, I'm going to tell you the story of a man now. That's right, it's what you've all been waiting for. It's Kevin. I don't know if I should be playing Subway Surfers on the side of this to keep your attention span, but I'm gonna do it just in case. So Strange Kevin was this TikTok user who would post the usual attempt at comedy videos and other miscellaneous content, but he really began to blow up when he posted this video in November 2022 of him lip syncing to Justin Bieber's boyfriend. Now, me personally, I physically recoiled when I saw him look like that because he looked like he was about to ask where my hug was at. But instantly after posting this, a lot of women actually began commenting and duetting this video, saying that he was somehow appealing to the female gaze, that he was doing something a lot of other men couldn't do. He began to get more and more views as he began to post similar content, and this was pretty much the only thing he was posting for like a month, was just videos like this. Ew. More and more women raved about his content, and he even inspired a trend where other men would try to emulate his switch from insecurity to confidence while lip-syncing to this song. This article attempts to explain what he's doing. Okay, so linking what Kevin does back to the definition of the female gaze, it looks as though he nails it through having the balance of being interested but not too forward. His eye contact is more complex and takes understanding and emotional intelligence to get the vibe of. Apparently, it's something in how he allows women to understand and feel his thoughts without having to outwardly sexualize women. It's quite smart when you think about it like that. Uh... I'm sorry. Is the definition of the female gaze in the room with us right now? Because I don't think so. I fear we have lost the plot. Because what do you mean by it's quite smart? It takes understanding and emotional intelligence to get the vibe of. I wasn't aware that getting the vibe of sexual harassment was something that necessitated a deep emotional maturity to understand. Now, we could sit here and theorize and dissect about how he aligns with the female gaze, 
but I don't want to do that. I don't want to because in order to do that, I would have to operate under a completely bastardized version of that term. Let's go back to the actual definition of the female gaze. It's not reclaiming the body and using it with intention to communicate feeling seeing, and it's not using the camera to show how it feels to be the object of the gaze either. I mean, sure, he is returning the gaze, but I'm not really feeling an emotional foundation under this video except for a general air of rattiness and entitlement. And also, he's an alleged abuser, so do with that particular irony what you will. Kevin's content is the complete opposite of the female gaze. In fact, it just perpetuates the male gaze. His content is about attracting and seducing women. It's just not in the way that you would expect. The woman, to him, is still an object to seduce and manipulate. His performance, however subversive, is still the performance of a man attempting to attract a woman. The male gaze, despite its more common usage among the female body, also affects the male body. When positioned in relation to a woman, it is often placed in the dominant position, highlighted as the power wielder in the situation. Every camera setup, every physical movement, every performance of man is still designed to give him the power in the situation. As the spectator identifies with the main male protagonist, he projects his look onto that of his like, his screen circuit, so that the power of the male protagonist as he controls events coincides with the active power of the erotic look, both giving a satisfying sense of omnipotence. The male protagonist is free to command the stage, a stage of spatial illusion in which he articulates the look and creates the action. Kevin perpetuates that idea. Even that quote analyzing his actions says it without actually saying it. He doesn't outwardly sexualize women, but he sure as hell still is sexualizing them. Kevin is looking out at the woman, becoming a spectator of her. He knows his audience is primarily women, and he's attempting to drag a certain performance out of them. One of the seduced women, a video of them being turned on by his actions. He knows what he's doing, and the worst part is, it's working. This concept just encourages more guidelines for gender performance to fit a different version of the gaze. We haven't destroyed one fence, we've just built another. A man sees women going feral over a certain man, so they begin to emulate aspects of that man that make them appealing. Less alpha male, more sensitive, sad, brooding, emotionally in tune man. But this is just another costume, it's another outfit to slip on, it's another character to perform. Butler's principle of gender performance is back in full force. Gender isn't parodied or bent in any way, it's just slightly expanded. There's another social construct and Kevin is acting accordingly. But this performance, because it aligns with the commonly accepted social construct with what women are calling the female gaze, it brings him success, it brings him attention, and it gets him the things that he's looking for. Okay. Guys, I need to tell you about this absolutely like crazy place that I just found out about. Um, it's called the Panopticon. Um, and basically, you just constantly feel a need to perform because you feel like you're being watched. Even if you don't know you're being watched, you just kind of have this constant fear and so it's like it's really really crazy and so i have a deal for you guys if you go to the link in my bio you can actually book your spot today um so like run don't walk to the link in my bio book your spot and honestly like you don't even need to book your spot because you're already here The Panopticon goes by many names. Architectural feat, philosophical experiment, psychological torture chamber. I mean, whatever you want to call her, she's very prevalent nowadays. The Panopticon prison is a structure where a circular building of a prison is overseen by one guard tower in the center. The prisoners can't see whether a guard is in the tower, but the guard, while in that tower, can look and see into every single cell within that prison. 
Therefore, the prisoners must always behave as if they are being watched because they don't know if somebody's in that tower. This prompts a constant performance and a fear of surveillance. This structure is extremely reminiscent of the internet, especially this platform, TikTok. Cursed love child of karaoke bars, sidewalk solicitation, and two-second attention spans, breeding ground of oversimplified discourse and coked-up consumerism. What started out as an app to post to lip-syncing videos has actually now become the closest thing we'll get to actual hell on earth. TikTok is the gaze's homing ground. To post is to perform, to always have a set of eyes on you, to conform to a certain set of standards even though no one is telling you to. I mean, you couldn't come up with a more perfect implementation of the gaze if you planted two eyes in the sky and told the entire world that they would die if they didn't behave. Well, TikTok isn't real life. Sure, something can be posted as authentic and real, but once you realize that the influencer probably had to set up their camera, hit record, go back to their bed, and then pretend to get up again, it doesn't feel as real, does it? Any presentation of the real world online will always be a performance of what we believe is authenticity, of a common conception that we perceive to be true. You are aware of the way that you act, always self-monitoring. Back in the panopticon of social media, performance is encouraged. It's a cycle. The eyes of viewers on social media prompt the performance of a certain identity. When people see this performance, they provide positive feedback, admiration, even idolization. Popularity grows and more eyes result in more standards and expectations. While I wouldn't consider TikTok videos to be the new French wave, there is an element of filmmaking within each video posted. The angles, the lighting, the sound, the content. I'd go so far as to say we can discuss film theory in relation to this platform. The male gaze thrives online and also functions much like the panopticon, a constant feeling of being watched, of catering to that certain gaze. Through this, you get various forms of the thirst trap of people making content catering to that male gaze. They know what draws an audience and they will act accordingly. They perform in a certain mode of sexuality to gain the power to attract an object to reach a goal. This specific video illustrates the intersection of the panopticon of the male gaze and social media. Both fuel each other like an Ouroboros of surveillance. Kevin is both the object of surveillance online, pushing him to perform a certain act of masculinity, and also a subject looking at you, perpetuating the male gaze. You are being objectified watching the video. You are being objectified watching this video. When he looks directly at the camera, you feel a sense of observation, suddenly aware of how his gaze affects you, even if he's not there in person. The platform of TikTok operates differently from a film camera because it actively invites the audience participation. It knows someone will be watching them. TikTok is a unique platform when it comes to the gaze and subject-object relation. When a creator sets up a camera, they know they will be watched by someone. When I set up this camera, I know I will be perceived in a certain way. I'm conscious of the way that I'm framed, how you're listening to me and looking at me. Creators are aware of the objects they become and will perform a certain way to appease the subject. However, the viewer is also being seen by the creator. In this way, online content adheres to the concept of returning the gaze. I see you seeing me. But instead of fully committing to that concept of a female gaze, the body remains an object for performance, for outward signifiers. The creator attempts to position their body in a way that displays authority, an identity sustained by fabrications. It's cursed, really, a never-ending relationship that pervades our media and seeps into our behavior online. The panopticon doesn't sleep. You can put that on a t-shirt. Okay, so we can all agree that Kevin is weird. Okay, um, but why are women describing him as the epitome of the female gaze? Kevin is just a minuscule part of a broader issue online. The concept of the female gaze has undergone one of the most severe bastardizations I've ever seen, transforming from film theory into oversimplified Female gaze is when man is nice, and male gaze is when woman is hot. That sort of thing tends to happen online when the opportunity for nuance is removed and everything turns black and white. 
The rapidity of every video on the platform combined with an ultra thin attention span from the audience means simplification thrives on TikTok. This isn't film theory anymore. It's just an aesthetic label. Since TikTok lives in this odd in-between of film and real life, the concept of the female gaze also slides into a gray area. Narratively, I'm sure videos posted online could align with the female gaze, but when Kevin leers at the camera, I personally don't get a sensation of him appeasing my female gaze. My female gaze. We've equated the theoretical female gaze with the actual physical female gaze. A man being attractive appeals to the personal gaze of a woman, while a woman living her life as a fully realized character appeals to the theoretical female gaze. Here are some answers of specific men who fit the so-called female gaze. Lori from Little Woman, Tom Holland, Peter Millard, Emmett Forrest. They're mature, empathetic, they express big emotions, and they respect women. Oh, and they're also hot. The common conception of the female gaze is now just a different way of describing a physically attractive man. But we don't say that. We say that he's written by a woman because he's in tune with his feelings. He's hot physically and mentally. You know, he's a decent human being. And you know what? That is okay. That is nothing to be ashamed of admitting. It's okay to think that a man looks nice. It's okay to think a woman looks nice. We don't live in the Hayes Code time period where expressing attraction is a sin and you'll be jailed if any person is shown in an attractive manner online. God forbid. This isn't falling victim to the male gaze. If you think Kevin is attractive, keep living your life. But the dilution of the male and female gaze has turned expressing physical attraction into some form of weakness as succumbing to the pressures of the patriarchal eye. So the online sphere has taken the female gaze and twisted it, though they might not say that outright, as simply the opposite of the male gaze. Now who's the object? We break this boundary by simply setting up a new one by saying, look, we're freed. You view the man as an object now and you give him new rules to perform under. The simplified definition of the female gaze does not break any boundaries. Rather, it simply stretches them out to define men and women in a broader way, to give new guidelines for gender performance. The simplified binary of male versus female gaze just substantiates the boundaries that we are struggling against. Because of this, it's extremely difficult to conceptualize the female gaze in real life. The subject-object relationship will always exist in the real world, as Sartre describes. Every time you cast your gaze onto something, the relationship develops. Every time you perceive another person or someone perceives you, the relationship develops. Additionally, as long as we exist in a patriarchal society, we will consistently be bound to the idea of performance under the traditional heterosexual hegemony. The female gaze resides in constructed media. It lives in the lens, in the glare of the lights, in the cuts of the camera. We cannot simply siphon it out and paste it onto the real world. If we try, we end up with an oversimplified, watered-down version that leads us right back to the performance that we wish so hard to escape. Mulvey even addresses this in her writing, stating, It faces us with the ultimate challenge, how to fight the unconscious structure like a language formed critically at the moment of the arrival of language, while still caught within the language of the patriarchy. There is no way in which we can produce an alternative out of the blue, but we can begin to make a break by examining patriarchy with the tools it provides. I can't propose a solution, and I doubt most people can, but I am optimistic, still. We have outlined and defined the male gaze. We understand its effects. If the way the male gaze within media permeated and influenced real life behavior can be translated to the female gaze, we may still have hope. If gender is a performance, we can change the rules. Butler describes this too, saying, There would be no true or false, real or distorted acts of gender, and the postulation of a true gendered identity would be revealed as a regulatory fiction. The dominant lens of reproductive heterosexuality can be twisted and undone. We do not have to view the performance of gender and the social constructs as the end-all be-all. Remember the principles of the female gaze. We have the ability to return the gaze, to reclaim the position of subjectivity. It might not happen today, or tomorrow, in the coming years or decades. But if we leave the Kevins of the world behind, if we acknowledge that our behavior and performance online is a social farce, and if we pull back from the performance of a certain construct on the body as the main priority, we just might break free. We just might.
one more thing, just, just one more thing. To answer the question in the title, Kevin is a pompous, self-righteous, unapologetic racist and misogynist whose entire platform is based on siphoning out the attention of the woman that he is also demeaning. He's a desperate lowlife who doesn't understand what a digital footprint is, and if I saw him walking towards me, I think I would cross the street. But who does he think he is? I would assume he thinks he is God's gift to womankind. But I think he's just a man.